Is it true that you found out that BCCI secretly or maybe not very well knowingly um, owned two other banks through your investigation that, that were that may or may not have been involved in the money laundering? That and one of those banks was also very closely linked to a political party or a leader of a political party in the US and you were uh, and I heard that you were told and advised to avoid that and just focus on what you were doing and to ignore that that was happening. What well, was there a bank connected to a political party that was connected to BCCI? Yes, there was. And um, I was told in detail about it by um, a gentleman in the Miami branch of BCCI who is a very interesting player in and of himself, Amjad Awan. Um, Amjad had quite a career. He had been an officer with another bank, one in Canada, well-known bank. And he um, subsequently had done time in Panama. He was the personal financial advisor for Manuel Noriega and a tremendous source of information for me as the eyes and ears of the government for detailed information concerning the financial affairs of Manuel Noriega, which I was able to get Awan to tell me about. But what made Mr. Awan so interesting to me is that his father was formerly the head of the national police in Pakistan, uh, at one time directed the uh, ISI. He managed accounts at BCCI that were CIA accounts. He helped them to move money to the Mujahideen to buy arms. He dealt directly with Casey, the head of the CIA. And he told me that there was this bank in Washington that on paper was owned by various nominees, but in fact was owned by the shareholders of BCCI who could not lawfully own it uh, because they were foreigners. And of course, the CEO of that bank was a former Secretary of Defense of the United States. Um, oddly enough, the wife of the Commissioner of Customs was an officer in that bank. Um, and he certainly knew we were inside the bank. Uh, but yes, and, and I was told by leaders and local leaders in Customs that I didn't need to be concerned about those issues, that I should keep my focus strictly on the movement of drug money through, um, through BCCI. I didn't, I mean, I'm, regardless of what somebody thinks that I should do, I can't tell the bad guy to stop talking about something. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I remember one of my last undercover meetings with Amjad Awan. You know, he became the focus of the U.S. government, despite the fact that I'm dealing with him undercover, and despite the fact that I'm begging the Kerry subcommittee to stay away from Awan and BCCI so I can get what I can get, um, they decide that they're going to try to subpoena him. And he's known to be the personal financial advisor for Manuel Noriega. So he called me one day and, you know, we, we agreed to meet and he said, man, I got some serious problems. So I met him at um, the Hyatt in Miami, um, just outside of, uh, you know, right out, of, uh, right out of Miami. And so we're there and he goes, Bob, you know, I've got these serious problems. The uh, subcommittee is trying to subpoena me. Luckily, there's this engineer by the name of Amjad Awan who happens to live in Miami as well. And they tried to subpoena him and they subpoenaed the wrong guy, but I found out about it. And now, and he names the person who is at the time very, very high up in the Democratic Party, who is a lawyer. And he said, and I met with this guy and he told me that I need to get out of the country, um, otherwise they're gonna subpoena me. So I'm being transferred to Paris and um, I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with this because I really don't want to go to Paris um, because that's the U.S. government's not going to stop. They're not going to give up. So, yeah, there was a lot of things that were going on. I, I considered BCCI 
and I'm afraid to say this, but it's the truth in my view, like many other powerful, big international institutions, have certain individuals who service people who have money seeking secrecy from governments. And that is a long list. That list includes not just drug traffickers, illegal arms dealers, money launderers, terrorists, um, people pilfering treasuries, people with corruption money, fraudsters, you yeah. name it. Yeah. Uh, they're all there. And, um, and, and that's not just, that creates a crossroad. It's a crossroad, also the intelligence community. It is a crossroad between the underworld, the political world, the intelligence world, all going through the same doors. When I was at BCCI, I oftentimes saw some very high level U.S. types at the Miami branch. Yeah. And the, the thing is as well, this, this, in banks, international banks, we've seen, you know, there's been news articles where there's already been fines. It's public knowledge. This is clearly still going on today. And, you know, I'm assuming that that may change a little bit with the introduction of um, cryptocurrency. However, you know, as a person myself, I, I, I find myself looking at all avenues of information and different opinions, different outlooks on things to, to learn. And, you know, you, you hear some people in their certain groups on social media that, that, that may look at things one dimension, you know, anti-government or um, anti this or pro that, and that's always their outlook. But certainly looking at the group of people that, you know, talk about things like one world order and, and all of these things. When I hear stories like this, where banks, cartels, political parties, and then individuals like yourself risking your life to find out the truth, to then be told to avoid certain stories and things you found out. To me, it's so difficult to, to challenge these people when these stories keep coming out over and over and over again that banks are continuously involved in this, this behavior. Do you, do you believe it's the banks themselves that look at this as a, as a profit, you know, it's part of their business? Or is it individuals within the banks that make this happen? I think it's a little bit of both. And I say that because if you take a very close look at the conduct of international banks, let's even just limit it to within the borders of Switzerland. You have to realize that at a minimum, with regard to the criminal offense of tax evasion, the private client divisions of virtually every one of those institutions has a protocol that they were offering to people around the world who had lots of money and didn't want to pay taxes. Not tax avoidance, we're talking tax evasion. Yeah. And that's no doubt. What you have to recognize is, and, and I think we get a cue here from the United Nations on Drugs and Crime Analysis, their analysis is that roughly $2 trillion a year is seeking secrecy from governments. $2 trillion a year is seeking money laundering services. Now, when we get into economic hard times, like 2008, and, and 2006, 2008, where we wind up with markets crashing, almost the only capital around is that capital. Why do you think some banks wound up marketing Sinaloa and bringing out, I mean, one, Wachovia doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, I mean, and I'm happy to talk about any of them, but, you know, come on, look at the story of Wachovia. Wachovia bought a line of business from the Union Bank of California that the Union Bank of California, previous because of handling those accounts, admitted to a criminal offense. Of course, they make it this pretty thing called intentionally failing to maintain an anti-money laundering program. No, it's money laundering, dude. That's what it really is. And the bottom line here is that, so they had this pocket of associations with Casas de Cambio in Mexico. They sold it to Wachovia. 
So now Wachovia takes it. Wachovia has no branches in Mexico. Their international branch based in Philadelphia and their Miami branch, they send account relationship managers down to Mexico to manage these relationships. They wind up bringing into the United States in the less than three years, $14 billion in U.S. currency. How do they bring it in? Oh, they put it on, they put it on, they, they get armored cars to go down there. They put it on pallets and they shrink wrap it. And then they bring it into, I think they brought it to San Diego where there was a counting house that the bank had and they counted the cash out and then they gave it to the credit of those, of, of course, Wachovia then takes it to the Fed and then they wind up giving credits to the accounts of those Casas de Cambios and give them the opportunity to wire money all over the world. Now, you've got to be kidding me. I'm telling you that money was five, tens, and twenties, but if you take the 14 billion and say it was $20 bills that were making the package smaller, I did the math. It would have been 780 tons of $20 bills. Where do you think you're going to get 780 tons of $20 bills, not just from Sinaloa, but in many cases from Culiacan, the city in Sinaloa, that is the birthplace of the leaders of the Sinaloa cartel. <laughs> Come on. And then after Wachovia gets caught, what happens? They pay a fine of $160 million. No one gets prosecuted. But what did they do with that line of business that got them in trouble? They sold it. They sold it to HSBC. And later on, HSBC paid a $1.92 billion fine. And if you look at Senator Levin, who I'm so disappointed is now retired because he was a voice of truth in the U.S. Senate on these issues. But if you look at, just Google Senator Levin, a subcommittee, HSBC, you'll get 300 and plus pages. Just read the first 20 or 30 pages of the executive summary section. You'll be appalled at the conduct that was carried out, and you'll even be more appalled when you'll think about the fact that not one person individually was held responsible whatsoever. And what troubles me even more is this appearance. The people who made the decision in those cases was the chief of the criminal division, Lanny Brower, uh, Bauer, Lanny Brewer, excuse me, Lanny Brewer. Of course, Eric Holder was the attorney general at the time. They basically made an economic decision in the disposition of these cases. Eric Holder as much as said that publicly. But what really troubles me is that after the HSBC deal, Lanny Brewer and Eric Holder, who previously were in the law firm of Covington and Burling in Washington, a firm that represents the biggest banks in the world, Lanny Brewer goes back to... Covington and Burling after the HSBC deal. According to the New York Times, his salary was in the range of four to five million dollars a year. Of course, Eric Holder is back there now too. We need to go out of our way to not allow even an appearance, an apparent appearance of a conflict of interest. These cases need to be handled by a special unit that winds up devoting themselves to these types of cases. The U.S. has done a wonderful job with that on the tax side, they offered to many people um, immunity. Come forward, tell us. Tell us about the money you hid in Switzerland and we'll give you immunity. You'll have to pay an extra 20%, but you'll get to keep the rest of the money. But most importantly, you need to tell us who you dealt with at the bank. Mm -hmm.